তখন সুনেরা সেই সময় কানাডাতে যেটা নারীদের খুব বড় একটা সংগঠন সবচেয়ে বড় সংগঠন ন্যাশনাল অ্যাকশন কমিটি তার প্রেসিডেন্ট এবং সেই সময় আমি সুনেরাকে দেখেছি যে অটোয়াতে যে একেবারে পার্লামেন্ট ভবনের সামনে বিশাল জনসভায় কিভাবে মানে বক্তৃতা দিয়েছে এবং তার এই প্রথম মানে কানাডায় কোনো সাদা মহিলা না বা অন্য রঙের মহিলা অন্য বর্ণের কেউ প্রেসিডেন্ট হতে পেরেছে তার জনপ্রিয়তাটা সেই সময় আমি কিন্তু দেখেছি এবং তার স্পষ্টবাদিতা এবং যে কথা তিনি বিশ্বাস করেন সেটা যে কিভাবে তুলে ধরতে পারেন এবং কানাডার মতো দেশে থেকে সেখানে সে সময় যেটা প্রয়োজন সেটা বলা তার জন্য অবশ্য তাকে অনেক কষ্ট পেতে হয়েছে অনেক রকম বিশেষ করে যখন ওয়ান ইলেভেন নাইন ইলেভেনের পরে এবং সে সময় যখন যে বিষয়গুলো তখন আমেরিকান ফরেন পলিসির বিরুদ্ধে এবং অন্যান্য কানেডিয়ান পলিসিরও বিরুদ্ধে যেগুলো সুনেরা পরিষ্কারভাবে বলেছেন সেটার জন্য তাকে অনেক ভোগান্তি পেতে হয়েছে কিন্তু তারপরও সুনেরা তার লেখায় এবং কাজে কখনো থেমে থাকেনি তো এক পর্যায়ে সে ভ্যাঙ্কুভার ভিক্টোরিয়াতে চলে গিয়ে এবং ওখানে এখন করছে তার এই বইটা আমি যাই না আপনাদের দেখেছেন কি না এক্সালটেড সাবজেক্টস স্টাডিজ ইন দ্য মেকিং অফ রেস অ্যান্ড নেশন ইন ক্যানাডা এটা খুবই একটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বই এটা আমি সুনেরার কাছে পেয়েছে আপনার পেতে চাইলে নারী গ্রন্থ প্রবর্তনে আসতে হবে মানে বিক্রি করার জন্য নাই কিন্তু পড়তে আসতে পারবেন আর এছাড়াও তার অনেকগুলো লেখা যেটা যেগুলো খুব মানে আলোড়ন তুলেছে কিংবা তার বক্তৃতা তার ইন্টারভিউগুলো কিন্তু আসলে খুব মানে চিন্তা করার বিষয় আর কি তো বাংলাদেশে কিন্তু সুনেরাই প্রথম না বাংলাদেশে আমাদের আমন্ত্রণে একবার আরেকবার এসছিলেন নাইনটিন ইট ওয়াজ ইন নাইনটিন এটা পপুলেশন কনফারেন্সের একটা ইয়ে ছিল যেটাতে আমরা আরও অনেককে ডেকেছিলাম নওয়াল সদ্দাবি এবং গায়ত্রী স্পিবাগ এরা সবাই এসছেন আর কি সে সময় সুনেরা বাংলাদেশে এসছেন এবং আমি যতবার কানাডায় যাই কোনো না কোনোভাবে সুনেরার সাথে আমার যোগাযোগ হয় তো আমি জানি যে আপনার সবাই অধীর আগ্রহে সুনেরার বক্তব্য শোনার জন্য বসে আছেন সুনেরা আজকে যদিও আমরা টপিকটা রেখেছি ফেমিনিজম অ্যান্ড কন্টেম্পোরারি গ্লোবাল পলিটিক্স কিন্তু আমি আসলে তাকে বিশেষভাবে অনুরোধ করেছি এবং তার সাথে কথা বলেও যেটা বলছে সেটা পরিষ্কারভাবে যে ফেমিনিজম অ্যান্ড ওয়ার অ্যান্ড টেরর এই বিষয়টাকে একটু পরিষ্কারভাবে বলা সো বাট উই হ্যাড ডিসকাশন এমাং আওয়ার সেলস ইজ দ্যাট ইউ উড বি অ্যাকচুয়ালি স্পিকিং অন মোর অন ফেমিনিজম অ্যান্ড ওয়ার অ্যান্ড টেরার তো সেই দৃষ্টিতেই মানে আপনার মানে সেটাই তার সাথে কথা হচ্ছে এবং তিনি এবার এসছেন বাংলাদেশে ঢাকা বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের ফিল্ম অ্যান্ড টেলিভিশন ডিপার্টমেন্টের একটা আমন্ত্রণে সেখানে একটা সম্মেলন হওয়ার কথা ছিল সেটা সেটারই অংশ হিসেবে এসছেন তারপর সুনেরা আমাদের জন্য দু তিন দিন সময় রেখেছেন কালকে আমরা তাকে নিয়ে গ্রামে চলে যাব যেটা আমি ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ ভিক্টোরিয়াতেও আমি যখন গেছি তখন দেখলাম যে সুনেরার সাথে কিন্তু শুধু যে অ্যাকাডেমিক আলোচনা হয় তা না সে যখন আয়োজনও করছে যারা কমিউনিটি বেসড কাজ করে বা ইন্ডিজিনাস পিপলদের নিয়ে কাজ করে বা ও ধরনের লোকদের সাথে দেখলাম সুনেরার সম্পর্ক তার মানে সে শুধু অ্যাকাডেমিক পার্সন না সে কিন্তু ভেরি মাচ কমিউনিটি পার্সন তো সেটা আমাকে তার ব্যাপারে আগ্রহী করে তুলেছে এবং আমি খুবই খুশি যে সুনেরা আসছে এবং আপনারা যারা আজকে এসছেন আপনাদেরকে সবাইকে খুবই ধন্যবাদ দিচ্ছি কারণ আমি বাংলাদেশে এই আলোচনাগুলো হোক এটা আমরা চাচ্ছিলাম এবং এই তাৎক্ষণিকভাবে আমি চিন্তার মুস্তাইন জহিরকে ধন্যবাদ জানাবো এবং চিন্তার পুরো গ্রুপকে ধন্যবাদ জানাই যে তারা তারাই মানে বিশেষ করে পুরো প্রোগ্রামটা আয়োজন করেছেন তো ইয়াংদের মধ্যে আগ্রহ সৃষ্টি হবে এবং আপনারা প্রশ্ন করবেন মেয়েরা প্রশ্ন করবেন এবং বিশেষ করে আমরা চাই যে সবাই আমরা সুনেরা বক্তব্যের পরে কিছুক্ষণ প্রশ্ন নেব 
তাহলে সে আলোচনাটা হবে তো আমি আর দেরি না করে সুনেরাকে আমন্ত্রণ জানাচ্ছি সো আই উড লাইক টু রিকোয়েস্ট ইউ টু স্পিক উইদাউট এনি ফার্দার ডিলে Thank you. Uh, so, um, I didn't understand because I don't speak Bengali at all. But I'm sure that Farida was far more generous in her introduction towards me than I deserve. <laughs> I'll try to live up to her introduction of me. Um, I would like to begin by thanking you all for coming here. I would also like to thank the organizers, Farida, Chinta, all the other young people who have um, organized this event, thank you very much, all the volunteers. Um, you know, having organized many events like this myself, I know how much work goes into it. So you have my deep thanks for that. Um, I will also begin with a little bit of an apology. I have a very bad cold, so I hope that um, things will go okay. If I have a coughing fit, then you just have to excuse me, please. Um, okay, so... Farida said something about my work in the women's movement in Canada. And, uh, you know, before I say what I have to say about this topic, f uh, feminism and contemporary global politics, I want to um, very clearly say that the analysis that I'm presenting here is based on a very particular context, which is very different from the context in Bangladesh. Uh, you know, I live in Canada. Um, I've lived in the West for many, many years now. And the issues that I am studying, I experience and witness around me most immediately in that context. So one of the reasons that I'm very happy to be here is that I really want to also learn how the context is different in Bangladesh. So whatever I'm saying, some of it might be relevant to your experience and some of it not. Uh, so just be very kind of aware that the, the context in which I live and do my work and my activism is very different. But the global relations of power that I study and talk about are not different. Hmm? Uh, so why is it important to think about feminism and feminism's relationship to contemporary global politics? And for me, very much the relationship between feminism and the war on terror. I think it's very important to take up this question because we're living in a time post 9-11 when the whole global political landscape is shifting. It has changed in very profound ways. Now some people think that 9-11 is just another incident amongst a lot of other incidents. But I feel that post 9-11 and the war on terror is a watershed moment that is really restructuring global politics, the global economic order, in a way which is going to shape the foreseeable future. So for those of us who are interested in questions of social justice, in questions of the status of women, in questions of the rights of women, of minorities, and at the end of the day, all, all human beings, it's very important to look at the movements with which we have been associated, and I've been an activist for you know, most of my life now. Uh, so it, this is my kind of interest in thinking about the relationship between feminism and global politics. So I will begin with the pre-9-11 moment and my feminist activism in Canada, which was, as Farida mentioned, connected to the global feminist networks. I was the president of Canada's largest feminist organization. And at that time, unlike previous presidents, when I became the president, we put a lot of emphasis on developing a space for us in global feminist networks. We also were committed <coughs> to transforming feminist politics within Canada. Because during, since the founding of the Canadian women's movement and up to the 1990s, the movement was dominated by white women. The feminism that they articulated was very much based on the experience of Western women. And other groups of women in Canada were not represented, indigenous women for example. Now I hope all of you know that much about Canadian history. 
that Canada is founded upon the colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples, much like the United States. Canada is also founded through the labor of immigrants of color who were, while they were allowed at certain moments in the history of the early history of the country to come into the country, they continued to be constructed as non-preferred races with less access to, to citizenship rights, if they had any rights at all, much like the US. And immigrants from India, from China, from Japan, from basically what we call the third world, had to fight very strongly to gain access to citizenship in Canada. So it's a very complicated kind of um, history, but it's a history that is deeply racialized, and it continues to be reproduced as a racialized history. So when women of color emerged in the leadership of the Canadian women's movement in the 1990s, it was a major shift in feminist politics. Those of us who entered these mainstream organizations were committed to an anti-colonial politics, to an anti-racist politics, and our commitment was to transform Canadian feminist politics into anti-imperialist politics. That was the major factor that was driving our political organizing at that time. So during the 1990s, of course, this was a period of neoliberal globalization, the escalation of this, the emergence of very strong social movements in Canada as in other parts of the world. Anti-globalization movements were very strong. And there was a very strong vocal opposition that was coming from what you can generally call people's movements, which included certain uh, women's movements as well. In, um, so this is the context before 9-11. And then, of course, part of the challenge that this transformation in feminist politics that I'm talking about was to challenge the kind of white privilege within the women's movement. In the Canadian context, this was tied to multicultural politics, the recognition that Canada was built by multiracial, multi-ethnic groups, indig indigenous groups who are still fighting for their sovereignty. So in a way, in the 1990s, there was a shift in how whiteness, how racism was being expressed. It had to contend with these challenges that came from these more radical movements. And then, of course, 9-11 happened, and we had the launch of the war on terror. And that changed everything. It changed everything for feminist politics as well. Suddenly, in Canada, the US, Europe, and globally, what we saw was a resurgence of Western power, a celebration of Western culture, a celebration of whiteness. You know, the ideology of the global war on terror, first in Afghanistan, then Iraq, and now it's still carrying on. The ideology of that war on terror is that the West is committed to democracy and freedom, women's rights, human rights, and now the rights of sexual minorities, in relation to which Islam was constructed as fanatic, as barbaric, as sanctioning misogyny, the hatred of women. Islam was presented as promoting violence. Muslims were presented in this public discourse and also in state policy. Muslims were being depicted as violent. Muslim men were now seen as inherently patriarchal, inherently misogynist, and Muslim women were depicted as passive objects who were suffering, and that the war on terror was actually being fought to save Muslim women from Muslim men. This was the core of the ideology of the war on terror. In fact, the Bush administration identified saving Afghan women as a major foreign policy objective. So this, you know, uh, this became a very critical moment for how would feminists respond to this? Because essentially, the war on Afghanistan, from my perspective, was an imperialist war. 
It was bringing back onto the global political agenda invasion, occupation, the Islamophobic politics, the Islamophobic ideology of the war on terror was very recognizable as an old colonial discourse that was now being reintroduced into global politics, but being reintroduced in a way that focused on demonizing Islam and Muslims. And the treatment of Muslims by the state was also very interesting to see. Because suddenly, communities who had been there for many generations, who had citizenship, who were part of the society, many of them integrated into the society in the US, in Europe, in Canada, suddenly now became the enemy within. Hmm? So we saw a lot of violence against Muslim communities. In terms of state violence, we had Muslims being rounded up for deportation. We had Muslims who were now facing intense discrimination in terms of immigration citizenship rights. After, <coughs> after the 9-11 attacks, we had Muslim organizations advise Muslim families to keep their children at home, not to send them to school because they were being attacked by schoolmates. Muslim women who were wearing the hijab, they were being attacked in the streets their hijabs were being torn off by uh, uh, um, you know, Canadian civilians. So we saw not only a state targeting of Muslims, but we also saw the emergence of a vigilante street violence that could erupt at any moment anywhere. And the interesting thing about this was that it was not only Muslims who were being attacked. In Canada, in the US, Sikhs were also being attacked. They were being quote-unquote mistaken for Muslims. Hindus were also being attacked. So we saw Muslim mosques being desecrated, but we also saw Hindu temples and Sikh gurdwaras also being attacked. And some of you might have followed the case of the uh, uh, attack on the Sikh gurdwara in Oak Creek in the US, where Sikh worshippers were shot dead by an American gunman. So an interesting politics was happening. On the one hand, the Muslim was being constructed as the most dangerous and threatening enemy, not only to Canada or the US, but to human civilization. But at the same time, Muslims were no longer being identified by their religion only. Because if you have Sikhs and Hindus who are also being attacked, what we were seeing was a conflation of race and religion. So anybody who looks like a Muslim, which means if you are black or brown, you are being targeted. So this was an interesting moment in terms of how religion was being redefined as was the question of race. And the shocking thing, of course, was the level of public support for this kind of violence. The level of public support for this kind of remaking of feminist politics, now as imperialist ideology, but also of racial politics. People openly defended racial profiling, rounding up Muslims, send them back, right? And that kind of politics has continued to grow. It has not diminished. In Canada, we're going through a bit of a transition right now, but essentially what we had was in Canada the introduction of legislation that was focused on barbaric cultural practices, right? This is how they called the new piece of legislation tied to the Immigration and Citizenship Act, that Canada was a tolerant country, that it was a civilized country, that they were not going to tolerate violence against women, and so they were going to stop immigrants from bringing in these barbaric cultural practices. And the immigrants who were being targeted were, of course, Muslims. Honor killings became now a, f a new cultural crime, right? Previously, we had had dowry deaths, this was used to you know, tarnish the whole immigrant community. Now suddenly, stoning women to death became the new you know, uh, uh, obsession in terms of feminist politics. Honor crime became the new obsession. Uh, so my question then became, how have feminists, how did they engage with this kind of discourse that was coming from the neoconservatives 
that was coming from the Bush administration, picked up by the Blair government, Labour government in the UK, and picked up in Canada also by the Liberal government of the time. So how were feminists responding to this? And especially for us in Canada, it was a very important question because we had gone through intense struggles in the women's movement to transform it to try and make it an anti-racist feminist politics, well, all of that was wiped out. And the one thing that happened is that most feminists endorsed this rhetoric. Most feminists picked up the discourse of Islamophobia and they gendered that discourse, right? They said, yes, Muslim women are being oppressed. And suddenly, there was a new opening for feminists to move into spaces which before had been closed to them. Suddenly, they were in the media. If you wanted to talk about how barbaric Islam is, you would be on every talk show there. If you wrote a book on how terrible Muslims are, it would become a number one bestseller. And in fact, a whole kind of industry has grown up over this. And Leela Abu Lugod, who's an anthropologist, has looked at this genre of writing, not just by white feminists, you know, I was a sex slave, my husband, you know, that, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, but also, women like Ayan Hirshi Ali, the caged virgin, right? Or Azar Nafisi, uh, reading Lolita in Tehran, or Irshad Manji, The Problem with Islam. All of these books, not only did these books become bestsellers, but also these women became now prominent public intellectuals. They got very high profile appointments at universities, in right wing think tanks. And so feminists, I think, they were speaking in the name of feminists. Many of them I would consider to be anti-feminists. So, but they, you know, there was a sudden space that was open for them, which had not been there before. In terms of white Western feminists, they now wanted to become part of the effort of saving Afghan women. So they wanted to be involved in the reconstruction projects in Afghanistan, right? We saw feminist filmmakers, suddenly the films they were making, the documentaries they were making, were receiving all kinds of awards, and most disturbing, awards from human rights agencies, right? Amnesty International, Film Festival, they give these awards to these kinds of stories. In the US, the State Department, when Colin Powell was the Secretary of State, actually established a stream of funding, funding for media training for women in Afghanistan. The project was go and give women in Afghanistan video cameras, teach them how to tell their stories. And of course, the stories that they told and that were circulated were about barbarism, about how oppressed they were. So this is the kind of feminist, feminist politics that became very popular. But what it did was it created a space for feminists now to build a new alliance with their own state, which previously, because of the anti-globalization movement, all of the anti-racist politics, we were really trying to shake that. Now suddenly, feminists had a new relationship with the state in Canada, in the US, and so from, you know, based on the research that I've done, one of the arguments I make is that this new imperialism of the 21st century is now articulated in the idiom of feminism. It is now articulated in the name of saving Muslim women. Now, those of us who have studied, and particularly in this region, I would expect that most of you would be aware that the same ideology was central to British rule in South Asia, right? The British came here. They were going to save women from sati. They were going to save women from child marriage. So for us, it's a very old, familiar colonial ideology. And yet suddenly it was as if we were, everybody had amnesia about this history. And with the resurgence of this kind of really strong, very robust Western uh, civilizational superiority, with the rise of that, many, many feminists who might otherwise have you know, known better were either intimidated and the level of state surveillance of Muslim communities, Muslim organizations was such that many other organizations who we might have worked with previously 
now wanted to have nothing to do with Muslims, right? It could have been because they also accepted this ideology, or it could have been that they didn't want the intimidation by the state. But what we have had happen there is that Muslims have become isolated, politically isolated. The only space from which Muslims can now engage in public political discourse is by endorsing this kind of politics. If they speak in the name of feminism, but a feminism that is a Western feminism, if they speak in the name of wanting to extend Western gender practices, Western gender ideologies, Western sexual ideologies into their own communities, that is the only place from which they can speak. Otherwise, there is no space to speak. You are demonized, you are attacked, you're isolated. So this is the kind of politics <coughs> that, uh, that has led me to make the kinds of analysis that, that I am making. So how did feminists respond? What was their, you know, I became interested in, okay, so they're supporting this war. I made a speech against the war, and you know, Farida mentioned that a bit, I think, but uh, my experience was not good. <laughs> um, so, uh, 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 so it was very clear that if you spoke out, you were actually putting your life on the line in many instances. But how were other feminists who claimed to be anti-imperialist, who claimed to have been part of these global women's networks that we were all part of, how did they respond to this kind of change political situation? And there were three, three uh, main responses that I was able to identify. One was coming from a liberal feminist, also a very pro-Zionist feminist, yeah? And that politics was very much the US and Israel are under threat by Muslims around the world who are fanatics, they've always hated us, they will always hate us, so we just need to make sure that we take care of that problem, right? And here we had the discourse, the idea of a new anti-Semitism that emerged, right? Phyllis Chesler, one of the mothers of liberal feminism in the West, wrote a book called The New Anti-Semitism. And that got picked up. In Canada, we had a parliamentary commission that was set up to investigate the new anti-Semitism. So what happened here is you have feminists opening the door for an even stronger alliance between the US, Canada, and um, Israel. So it was a very liberal feminist, but clearly pro-Zionist lobby. That was one response. The other response came from uh, Marxist feminists and socialist feminists, who you know you would uh, I would have thought would be more aware about imperialism, colonialism, and the argument there was very much that yes, the U.S. is an imperialist power. We oppose that. Yes, women are oppressed in the U.S. as well. And a new language emerged that now women are experiencing sexual terrorism in the US, okay? But when they turned to look at Afghanistan and the Middle East, the argument they made was that these societies are based on gender apartheid, okay? So equating gender norms in, and gender relationships, which obviously were problematic in many, many ways, but equating that with apartheid in South Africa. And so Muslims now, they said, live with gender apartheid. And here, we saw the same kind of argument, saying that it's Islam that's responsible for this. And that allowed socialist feminists and Marxist feminists to say, Muslim women and feminists in the West should unite. We have a common cause, we're fighting patriarchy. The way we experience patriarchy in the West is through sexual terrorism. The way you are experiencing patriarchy is through gender apartheid. So we need a feminist struggle, feminist coalition. Of course, what that does is it hides from view that Western women are part of an imperialist society, that they live in an imperialist state. And so they are placed unequally, right? So you see this conflation. Oh, I live in the US, I might be a middle class or you know, elite woman professor like myself maybe, but you know, I'm really the same as the poor woman in Afghanistan whose village is being bombed 
because she's experiencing gender apartheid and I'm experiencing sexual terrorism here, right? So that was the kind of conflation that was taking place, which was very, very, um, of course, dangerous. And as um, uh, feminists of color and black feminists, we have argued really strongly for an intersectional feminist politics that looks at gender, but also the intersection of gender with class, with race, with sexuality, with disability, so that we complicate right, the power relations that exist between women, particularly in a global context. So that was the other kind of approach. And the third approach was to say, oh, uh, and this came from the post-structuralist and the post-modernist feminists, suddenly you know that we are all vulnerable to violence. We're all dependent on other people to take care of us. And so this vulnerability to violence has to be recognized and we have to respond from that position. And if you read the feminist literature now on the war on terror, you will find it full of the concept of disposable life, bare life, right? Again, you have a conflation here of women, men, people who live in the third world to those who live in the imperialist center of the global economy. And the argument is that we're all equally vulnerable to violence, which again is a very nonsensical argument from my position. Yes, in some way, every human being is uh, vulnerable to violence. But to say that the vulnerability of violence is the same for women in Syria today who are being bombed, for women in Iraq who are being bombed by American women pilots, right? To say that their vulnerability was the same was a very self-serving argument and obviously not a very convincing one. So from all of this kind of research that I've done, what I found is that for the most part, with very, very few exceptions, feminists have actually promoted this Islamophobic discourse at the global level. And what the Islamophobic discourse has enabled is to make violence the central factor in the governance of Muslims wherever they live, right? We see this in Obama's drone wars. Hmm? They use the drone wars, don't know how many people have been killed. They just have to say this is a suspect militant or a suspected terrorist. There is no legal procedure. They go and kill. We know huge numbers of civilians, including women and children, are being killed by these kind of drone wars. So violence has now emerged as the central modality of governance of Muslims. In the West, in different kinds of ways, the threat of deportation, the threat of being sent abroad for rendition, as has happened in a number of cases, right? The vigilante violence, which has now become part of everyday life, being taken, uh, you know, being rounded up, taken in for questioning, citizenship rights suspended, detention. So that threat is always there. And what we see globally is the bombing, the drone wars. These have now become part of the governance of the global order. And what we see is that we, there is very, very little feminist opposition to that. If, in fact, we see hardly any opposition to invasion, to colonialism. These are all now present realities, right? In a way that they were not before. So what science, we're also seeing the attack on uh, any kind of revolutionary forces that are emerging to challenge this kind of Western imperialism. And we're also seeing the supporting of counter-revolutionary forces in different kinds of ways, in different countries, in different situations. But what we are definitely seeing is a complete remaking of the post-colonial global order. We're seeing the destruction of the post-colonial state, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, now Syria, Yemen. We're seeing the destruction of that state. And you know, not that those states were good. There were lots of opposition, internal opposition as well. But what we're now seeing is the emergence of violence to a catastrophic level, which is destroying the infrastructures of those societies. You have all seen probably images of the refugee flows that are trying to get into Europe now. 
millions, tens of millions of people, their societies have been destroyed, right? And then not being allowed uh, um, uh, entry into European countries, into North America, the very countries that are waging war, that are destroying their societies, are, of course, refusing to take any responsibility for the condition in which these millions of peoples, how many tens of thousands have drowned in the Mediterranean. You might have seen the photograph of that little boy, Ailan Kurdi. Hmm? How many tens of thousands have drowned? And this is a daily occurrence. And this has now become the new norm. And it's outrageous that feminists have not taken up these issues. The biggest scandal is that the number of Muslim women and children who are being killed in Afghanistan, in Iraq, there is not one feminist group that I have found or heard about that is trying to even keep track of the numbers that have been killed. We don't even know that. And this is one of the biggest scandals for feminism, that there is not one group in the world that wants to do this kind of work. It's as if state violence against women does not count as patriarchal violence, as if that does not count <laughs> as violence against women, against children. So, uh, you know, it's for these kinds of reasons a number of people think that the positions I'm taking are very extreme, but it's for this kind of reason. The death, the destruction that we see around us, it's our responsibility to do something about us, and especially if we call ourselves feminist, right? Is this feminist politics to actually facilitate the extension of this kind of violence around the world? So I, you know, I want to close. I think I've taken up a lot of time now. I can take a few more minutes? Okay, so I'll take, I'll take a few more minutes. So um, I'll just kind of recap what I think are the main points around my argument that feminism is now the new imperialism of the 21st century. One is that feminists have actually, in the ways that I've described, endorsed Islamophobia. And Islamophobia is defined by, men, by many people as the hatred and fear of Islam. So feminists have played a very key role in inciting this kind of hatred towards Islam. And I think it's a huge challenge that feminists continue to refuse to engage with Muslim women who also are contesting the meaning of Islam, who are fighting for their rights in Islam. And feminists refuse to engage with them. They see them as dupes, as oppressed, as passive. And I think that that is a big mistake that many feminist organizations are making right now. The second thing is feminists, you know, are unself-reflexively extending Western gender norms, Western sexual norms and practices. And in this way, they are upholding the claim of Western civilizational superiority. They also continue to see the West as the only formation that is capable of giving women equality. And we know that this is a failed project because even Western women in the West do not have equality. Even they live with violence. Western law has not protected their rights. And in fact, the level of violence in Canadian society is pretty intense. And it is directed against particular groups of women. Now most, most people are surprised when I say I live in Canada. Canada has a particular kind of image globally as a very tolerant, progressive society. I live in Vancouver, which is one of a, the most beautiful places in the world. Vancouver has that reputation. It's also one of the most multi-racial and multi-ethnic diverse city. But in the city that I live in, over 150 Aboriginal women have disappeared from the streets. They have been abducted, they have been raped, they have been sexually assaulted, and their bodies have been dumped. Now, can you imagine living in a city where this kind of violence occurs 
against indigenous women. And feminists have not done much about it. The only group of women who have tried to say no, these are our sisters, we can't let them be killed in this way, are Aboriginal women's groups. So they continue to live with this kind of violence, but nobody stands up and says, oh, this violence is Canadian culture, that this violence is Western culture, right? If a perpetrator is found, if he is charged, if he is convicted, the whole depiction of this violence is that he was mentally unbalanced, you know, that there was something that happened in his life to trigger this. So the violence, even when it is acknowledged, is acknowledged as an individual man's violence. But if you have any incident of violence in immigrant communities, whether it's Muslim communities, whether it's Hindu communities, immediately they will say it's their culture. This is Islam. This is arranged marriage. This, and so the entire community, the entire culture is held responsible. But when we have this scale of violence, and I'm talking only about Vancouver, this kind of rape and abuse and murder of Aboriginal women happens in every major Canadian city. And the situation is so serious now that the government is going to appoint an inquiry to look into why what are the causes for this level of sexual violence against Aboriginal women? But nobody stands up and makes the argument that this is Canadian culture, right? And of course, there's a whole history of this kind of violence against Indigenous women. I also think the other point that is really important for us to understand is that it's through these kinds of feminist politics that white feminists have managed to reassert their control over the global feminist agenda. Hmm? Before, in the 1990s, there was some kind of challenge to that kind of racist construct of third world women, as passive, as you know, uh, oppressed by tradition, blah, 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 right? In the 1990s, there were intense battles about that. Post 9-11, feminists have now come to the conclusion, we were right, you were always barbaric, right? That we were being politically correct when we were taking you seriously. But look what Muslim men are doing now. And what that has allowed is for feminist, Western feminism, to reassert their hegemony over global feminist politics, and in a completely unself-reflexive way. The other thing that feminists refuse to do is to look at women's investment in this kind of violence. Everybody saw the Abu Ghraib photographs, right? When people will look back on this period of history, hmm, they will remember the attacks of 9-11. They will also remember Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay. How can you erase those images from your mind, right? And what we saw very clearly there was women participating in that violence, sexual violence, in the same way that men were participating. So this idea, feminist, the feminist claim that when women have access to power, we will do things differently, was completely blown out of the water by Abu Ghraib. And what was the feminist response in the West to Abu Ghraib? The response was, these women have polluted feminism. They have hijacked feminism. And what the, the, all the feminists who wrote about this is they were so traumatized by this. And what they wrote about was, this is not the feminism that I fought for, right? These women have corrupted that feminism. And I'm heartbroken. How can women do about it? The violence that was done to Muslim bodies disappeared from their writings. Huh? They did not engage the violence that was being done to Muslim men and to Muslim women. Those photographs have not yet been released. Instead, it was this narcissistic, self-pitying, oh, look what they have done to our feminism, which is really quite pure, right? And of course, the other issue was that these women who are the prison guards, that they come from the lower classes. They're not educated. Right? Again, a classic feminist argument, you know, that women who come from lower classes don't really, you know, uh, know what they're doing. They're being duped or they're too stupid to know what they're doing. It was a classic kind of feminist response, which again was, 
you know, very, very disturbing because to refuse to acknowledge the level of violence that is being done by women as well as men needs to be taken up and feminists are not ready to do that. So I want to end my talk now. I think I've taken enough of your time. Yes, I will be happy to take uh, questions and also, you know, learn from your perspective here, um, you know, how you see these issues because f women's rights have been very, very important for us. Human rights have been very, very important for us. But now, when they are serving an imperialist project, we have to rethink that politics. We have to rethink what we mean when we use these terms. Thank you very much.